Friends, in order to support Parenting Great Kids, we need the help of some great advertisers. And in order to find great advertisers, we need to learn a little more about you. So could you do me a favor, please? Go to podsurvey.com forward slash Meg and take a quick anonymous survey that will help us get to know you a little better. Even if you've taken a podcast listener survey before, this one is specific to Parenting Great Kids. So I really need you to take it too. Plus, once you've completed the survey, you can enter to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Again, that's podsurvey.com slash Meg. And thank you for your help. Moms wear a lot of hats these days with phones keeping them connected to everyone. That's why you should try Total Wireless. With nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable networks, unlimited talk and text starts at just $35 a month. Family plans with four lines are available, too, starting at $25 a month. Go to TotalWireless.com to learn more. For 30-plus years, I've seen every type of child grow up. Instead of giving me what I wanted, she gave me what I needed, which was truth. Don't let emotions win. Let truth win. Do your very best, and you should have a lot of fun while you do it. And the better you get at something, the more fun you're going to have at something. You moms and dads are wired with everything you need to be a parent to a great kid. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. This is episode number 23, Sleep Issues in Kids. I'm your host, Dr. Meg Meeker, and have I got a show for you today. My guest on this episode is the sleep guru, Dr. Bill Sears. He has authored numerous great parenting books, including The Sleep Book, The Attachment Parenting Book, The Baby Book, Everything You Need to Know About Your Baby from Birth to Two, and his son is familiar to many of you. He's Dr. Robert Sears. He's the author of the vaccine book, and he appears on the popular syndicated show, The Doctors, a family chock full of pediatricians, so it's really fun to see. But Dr. Bill Sears is Dr. Bob Sears' father. Also in this episode, I'll be featuring listener questions about balancing love and discipline, and I'll also be talking about sibling competition. As always, I'll share my points to ponder so that you can start using something right away. And parents, as a reminder, don't just download these episodes. Click subscribe, because when you do that, you're joining my parenting revolution and every new episode will automatically show up in your subscribe list. You won't regret it. And I'd love for you to write a review of this podcast on iTunes. Let me know what you think. This podcast is for you. So I want to know what topics do you want to hear about? What guests do you want me to interview? This is yours. So own it. Let me know what you think about it. Also, the podcast is not only on iTunes, but Parenting Great Kids is also now available in the Google Play Store and on Stitcher. So no matter where you get your podcast, subscribe today and don't miss out on a single episode. So parents, thanks for listening. This is episode number 23. Stay with me. So now I want to talk about my points to ponder. Number one. Help your baby establish a good sleep environment. It's very important for your baby to have a place that he or she sleeps that feels comfortable, that feels warm, and that feels safe. Because when a baby feels comfortable and warm and safe, they'll sleep better. So I recommend that you have your baby sleep in the same place for naps as for nighttime. Now, many of you can and many of you can't do that. Some of you have babies that go to daycare and some, you know, they go to a babysitter's house. Some of you may have a nanny that comes into your house. But as best you can, replicate nap time during the nighttime sleep. In other words, if baby sleeps in a crib at nap time, use the same blankets, try to make the sheets the same smell, try to use the same lighting in the room for a nap that you do at nighttime, have the same routine for going to sleep at nap time that you do during the evening. So in other words, make the two environments, nap time 
and nighttime sleep very, very similar because that will teach your baby to have cues. Now it's time to go to sleep. If you have your baby sleeping once in a swing and then once in a car seat and and once in a crib and then once somewhere else, they never really feel comfortable and they never really rest. They just learn to sleep in different places. And that's a bit disruptive to them. Kids have a rhythm. They need a rhythm. They need a routine. And that routine makes them feel safe. So as best you can, make the sleep environment of nap time and nighttime sleep very, very similar. Two, this is hard, put baby to bed awake. And here's why it's important. It's so easy to bring our babies in and rock them and nurse them, or if maybe dad's doing it, rock them and bottle feed them, sing them a song and lull them to sleep, and then very quietly tiptoe over to the crib and lay baby down. But the problem with this is that babies don't sleep through the night until they're over two. They waken off and on during the night. Baby will waken an hour later, two hours later, and he'll look around and he might be frightened. Why? Because the last thing he remembers is being in your arms and safe and cozy with you. And now you're not there and he's in this dark room and what happened? So it can be very disturbing to babies. So if you rock them and you feed them and you get them sleepy, but not completely asleep, and you put them in the crib, they remember, oh, okay, I'm going to bed. Mommy or daddy is going to leave. It's okay. And I'm safe. And they see the separation occurring there. And so when they waken in the night, they remember, oh yeah, that's right. Mommy or daddy left a while ago. And so it's very important to teach your children that they're safe in their crib alone and that they can self-soothe. They don't need to be soothed to the point of falling asleep every time by you. If they learn to depend on you to go to sleep, you're going to be going in there all night long because normally an 18-month-old, a one-year-old, a six-month-old wakes up three or four times during the night. They've got to learn to self-soothe. This is very, very hard for parents because we don't want our kids to cry. And we feel if they're crying, then something is terribly wrong. And it's not always terribly wrong. But remember, we need to put them in the crib not completely asleep because we need to teach them to self-soothe. My third point to ponder is this. Help your baby establish a good eating and sleep rhythm. In my day when we were raising our babies, um, everything was on demand. Babies would sleep on demand. They would feed on demand. And we basically were taught when I was a young mother uh, 30 years ago that whatever baby wanted, we needed to accommodate. So if baby cried, we would nurse, uh, whether it was every half hour, every hour, it didn't matter, just be at the baby's beck and call. The problem is babies don't know how to establish a rhythm. And if they don't ever get into a rhythm and we just sort of let them lead us, then they're topsy-turvy all the time. Babies need a rhythm. We need a rhythm. We need a pattern. We need a sense of, this gives us a sense of security. I have eating times, I have sleeping times, I have play times, I have awake times, I have fussy times, whatever it is. One of the correlations that I have found is that if baby is full and satisfied, they sleep better. Now think about this. If you feed your baby every hour throughout a 12-hour day, he never gets hungry, but he never gets full. But if you make the baby wait a couple of hours or three or four hours in between feeds, and I'm talking here to a healthy full-term baby over seven or eight pounds. I'm not talking about a preemie. I'm not talking about a five-pound baby. That's a different category. But for a healthy full-term baby, you know, feeding them, letting them get really hungry and then eat and get really full, they're going to sleep better. By regulating their eating, you can really help regulate their sleep. So I recommend that you help baby establish a sleep pattern around their eating pattern. So in other words, if you wake them up and they play in the morning, they're ready to go down for a nap and you let them get a little bit hungry, you feed them until they're satisfied, you put them down for a nap, they're going to sleep for a couple of hours. If they only eat for a couple minutes because they ate uh, an hour before and they're not really very hungry, they're not going to sleep very well. So you as a parent need to lead here. You need to help coerce your baby into a good eating pattern. And you will find if you do this and you stay at that, then they're going to sleep more regularly. So really try to help your baby establish a really healthy eating rhythm 
and then they're going to establish a healthy sleep rhythm. And then you're going to have a much happier baby. But remember, this is something that you had to take charge of, and you're going to have to impose it a little bit on your baby. But I guarantee you it works. It works very, very beautifully. But it does take some work. It'll take you a good month or two to help your baby establish a good rhythm. But remember, we all need rhythm. So you're not being cruel to your baby by establishing eating patterns and then good sleep patterns. You're you're really helping baby do something that he wants to do but can't on his own. Friends, I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Bill Sears onto Parenting Great Kids podcast. I know you're going to love our conversation. He's a little bit like talking to Mr. Fred Rogers crossed with Dr. Marcus Welby. And many of you don't know who Marcus Welby was, but it was a television show with this uh, old-time family doctor who'd go to people's homes and he'd take care of the kids and the and the family. He's the doctor everybody wanted to have. If you could pick a perfect doctor, it would be Dr. Marcus Welby. So he's got that sort of Fred Rogers, Marcus Welby thing going on. He's the kind of guy that you'd like to just bring home with you and sit and talk to for hours so that he could teach you how to um, how to nurture your baby really well. He's really delightful, so you've got to stay tuned and listen to him. Well, I'm excited to have with me today Dr. Bill Sears, who has written numerous books on child care. He's written The Baby Book, The Discipline Book, The Attachment Parenting Book, which I particularly love. But we're going to talk about today is The Baby Sleep Book and Baby Sleeping. Um, Dr. Sears, I'm so grateful you're here. As I told you you know, before, to me, you're sort of the sleep guru um, when it comes to having helping babies go to sleep. And uh, so I really appreciate your being Being with me today. Uh, Good morning, Meg. Uh, Happy to be with you. Now, Dr. Sears, are you are you in practice or have you retired? Yes, yes, I'm still practicing. Actually, uh, Meg, this is my fiftieth year. (gasps) Congratulations! This has been a wonderful year for me. We've just celebrated our fiftieth wedding anniversary and my fiftieth year as a doctor all together. So. This has uh, been a good year. It's a wonderful congratulations. Boy, that's great. Um, you know, sleep is a difficult topic for a lot of parents with young children. Um, not just their lack of sleep, but the baby's lack of sleep. And they really struggle, in my experience, particularly during those first six months of life. And you describe in your book five ways that parents can help their babies sleep. But one of those is learning to understand your your baby's tired time. So to help parents understand when their baby is yeah. tired. So how can a parent with a two, three, four month old differentiate the baby's cry if they're tired or they're frustrated or they're hungry? What do you usually tell your patients? What I usually tell my patients, uh, Dr. Meg, and I thank you for the compliment, sleep problems are the number one issue that we pediatricians get asked about. It's also the number one issue in which there's more bad advice out there. Yes. And so that's what we want to do in the Baby Sleep Book is give parents tools. And these are tools to get a better night's sleep. So the first is you mentioned look for the tired signs because babies like a predictable sleep pattern and a time to go to bed. And that's part of it being a a new mom and a new dad, being observant. Watch your baby's cues. The eyes start to close. Are they start getting a little bit fussy? Are they start getting quiet? Observe the tired signs. And that's the time to put your baby to bed. Because that's the time that the baby's brain is clicking on and secreting the melatonin, the, hey, it's time to go to bed hormone. Mm -hmm. And if you miss that, then the baby kind of wakes up. So watch for the time to go to bed sign. And the secondly is where should baby sleep? Mm. Answer, wherever all of you get the best night's sleep. (laughs) And that may change from month to month as baby's sleep cycles change and their, their whole needs change. And even the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that every baby should sleep in the parent's room for the first six months to a year. So where should baby sleep again? Wherever you all get the most night's sleep. And I find in our practice, 
most parents sleep the best and babies sleep the best in a bedside co-sleeper, a, a crib-like bassinet that attaches securely and safely to your bed. Mm-hmm. So the baby and the mother are – they have their separate spaces so they don't wake each other up, but they're within arm's reach of one another for easier feeding and comforting. Baby wakes up. And mommy wakes up because they have the same sleep cycles in their brain, mommy Mm -hmm. brain, baby brain. And mommy can get the baby back to sleep before either one completely awaken. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have your baby in another room or far away from you, baby wakes up. Well, by the time you run down the hall or by the time you get to baby, baby's wide awake and upset. You're wide awake and upset. So the closer you two can be together the better. Mm -hmm. And the big question I get, in fact, I have medical students rotating through my practice, and mothers will say, well, how long should I let my baby cry? And I don't answer it. And the medical students will say, you didn't answer the mother's question. Mm -hmm. I say, because I am not the mother. We We should not be giving parents time limits. Oh, well, let them cry 10 minutes. We don't know because we don't have the mommy brain. Mm-hmm. And, and parents, moms often forget that, that when you grow a baby in your room, you mm-hmm. grow a center in your brain that tells you, oh, that's a red alert. My baby needs me. That's a quickly respond cry. Mm-hmm. Also, oh, you know, that's a, she's just a little bit fussy. I don't have to rush and comfort her. Maybe she'll resettle. And that comes by listening to your baby. And the simplest piece of advice I give all new parents, because parenting is a series of reactions. My baby does this, what do I do? So here's Dr. Bill's number one parenting advice that has taken me 50 years to learn and eight children. Get behind the eyes of your baby. Mm -hmm. When your baby wakes up, you don't imagine, you know, am I going to spoil her? Shall I let him cry? All that stuff the books say. No, no. The first thing that comes into your mind is, if I were my baby, how would I want my mother to respond? Mm. And you'll (sighs) always get it right. See, so follow that instinct. That is the key. Don't pay pay attention to these sleep training books that give you uh, 10.5 minutes. Because every baby is different. You know, it's very interesting. I use that same line, but I've never done it with babies. Trying to encourage parents to get behind the eyes of their 8-year-old or their 12 or their 18-year-old. It's so important because what kids see is so different from what parents try Mm -hmm. to do. Um, What would you say to the mother who has the 6-month-old or 4-month-old in her room She's a light sleeper, and the baby's waking up every hour and a half through the night crying and fussing, and she doesn't know what to do. What would you tell that mother to do? All right. Now, uh, it's interesting. Waking up crying and fussing a lot. That is a very common complaint, even in the early months. Mm -hmm. And I started studying this back in the 90s because I thought, you know, if babies wake up in pain, you know, moms would say, and they say, well, you know, I went to the emergency room. I went to another doctor, and they said, well, it's colic. First thing I say, colic is a five-letter word, meaning the doctor doesn't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you are an honest pediatrician. Because <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. Because when a baby wakes up in pain, there is a reason. So we started studying this, and most of the time, it's gastroesophageal reflux. Mm-hmm. So I mentioned this in the early, in the first three months, if babies are waking up in pain, that's the first thing I ask you, does your baby really look like he's hurting? And mom will say, well, no, just, just some fussy and it comforts easily, no problem. But if mom says, no, I, I, you know, I, and here's the key. Doctor, I just think he hurts somewhere. Mm. Bingo, go to your doctor and have baby checked for Reflux, heartburn, mm-hmm. that's what adults call heartburn. So that's, no, that's the number one painful reason for waking up. Now, another thing to your question, when babies wake up more often, you know, I hear this a lot and I'm sure you do too. Oh, we're sleeping fine. Then you're starting to wake up a lot. Well, a couple of things are going on. One, going through a growth spurt. So they wake up more because they need to eat more. Secondly, the older baby gets, the more little separation anxiety Mm -hmm. So sometimes the older they get, the closer they need to be to mom. But again, 
uh, parents often will say, well, you know, where should my baby sleep, Dr. Bill? So I say, okay, again, I give you the answer. Uh, wherever all babies sleep the best is the right arrangement for your family. However, get behind the eyes of your baby and imagine, if I were my baby, would I rather sleep in a dark, lonely room behind bars, <laughs> separated from my behind beautiful bars. family, or would I rather want to sleep close to my favorite person in the whole wide world, a foot away from my favorite cuisine. Life is good. See, so this, this, so as soon as mom said, gosh, I've never thought of it that way. You're right. That's why my baby sleeps better the closer my baby is. Talk about sleep environment, and you do talk about a good sleep environment, and I find myself talking to parents about this too, and one of the things that I feel, you know, babies need is a familiar environment. You know, when yeah. they go to sleep, they need to smell the same smell or hear the mm-hmm. same sounds and they need their body needs cues. OK, it's time to go to sleep. And I often recommend yes. that parents have a, a sleep routine for their babies, particularly before nap time and bedtime where, you know, you rock them, you turn on a musical toy and it's the same song over and over. What do you mean by creating a good sleep environment? Yes, and and I totally agree with everything you just said. This is called medically a setting event. In other words, when you get into a routine like a certain time, a certain dimming of light, a song that you sing, a warm bath, uh, and then a nursing down, when the baby starts the routine – you trigger a center in the baby's brain, a familiarity center Mm -hmm. that says, ah, this starts my favorite routine, and my favorite routine ends with going to sleep. It's like you're starting a symphony, Mm -hmm. and the opening note prepares you for the close of the symphony, which is going off to sleep. Sometimes I know parents will, as they're trying to train their child into this routine, mothers will often say, so my baby wakes up, he's up for, say, four months old, he's up for a couple of hours, he looks tired, I go to put him down, he falls asleep, and he's asleep for a half hour, and he wakes up crying, and I can't get him back to sleep. How do you encourage parents to get their kids or coerce their kids into sleeping longer periods of time, not just, you know, multiple 30-minute naps throughout the day, but Mm -hmm. sort of getting them into a a good routine of a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours in the afternoon. This is important because babies love routines. So I encourage all new moms who are home with their babies, develop a nap schedule that's good for you. Mm. For example, 11 o'clock and 4 o'clock. Just mm-hmm. an example, are 11 o'clock and 3 o'clock. You pick two times a day that you are the most tired and nap with your baby. See, the mistake parents make is, okay, I can't wait for my baby to, to nap so I can get something done. Well, you are getting something done. You are doing the most important job in the world, mm-hmm. nurturing a little human being. And nurturing what we call healthy sleep habits, you are imprinting into that child that sleep is a pleasant state to enter and a happy state to remain in. So if you have that schedule where, say, 11 and 3, whatever works for you, you nap nurse. And pretty soon the baby will get into that schedule and you'll notice 11 o'clock, sure enough, the eyes start to glaze over and baby, as if baby could talk to mommy, time to go to nap. Mm -hmm. And you spend that nestle time with your baby, that special time that your baby's going to soon outgrow. What would you do, though, if you have multiple kids? Because you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. we always had multiple kids. You always had multiple kids. And so, so you, you, you know, you're on, you're on child number five, or Martha's on child number five. And, and you know, I, I do like the idea. I like to hear you say, though, that parents should establish a sleep routine for the children that works for the family and for the parents. Because I think many times mothers end up sort of chasing around their kids and managing their schedule around what the child wants. And 
it doesn't work because the child doesn't know what they want or what they need. So what would you do if you had, you know, with multiple kids and you can't spend the time to go in and, you know, relax yeah, we, with the we, baby? Uh, we had this with uh, uh, now Dr. Jim and Dr. Bob. Uh, Dr. Yes. Dr. Jim's 50 and Dr. Bob's <laughs> 48. <laughs> so what's interesting is what we would do is we called it special time. See, toddlers love the term special. You know, they feel special. So we'd have a, a special bed, we called it, at the foot of our bed, which is a, a toddler mattress. So when, say, 11 o'clock came or 2 o'clock came, Martha would lie down with our baby and nap nurse. But the toddler then would come also at the same time and lie in the special bed. Mm. But you have to be as quiet as a mousy so you don't wake up mommy and baby while we're sleeping. Mommy needs some sleep, so don't wake up mommy. Be as quiet as a mouse. Mm-hmm. Because if mommy wakes up too much, I become cranky, and cranky moms are no fun. Mm-hmm. So even a two to three year old will get that. We need to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Parents, we all know that talking with our kids about sex is uncomfortable. And when it comes to having that initial talk with your child about sex when they're about eight years old, I always say in every couple, there's one who's a chicken and one who's an even bigger chicken who just won't have the talk at all. But the truth is, no matter how uncomfortable it is, beginning a conversation about sex early with your child is extremely important because it puts you in the driver's seat. The tricky part is many parents often don't know where to begin or where to end? What if they say the wrong thing? What if they talk too much or too little or use the wrong words? Too often, not knowing how or when they should approach the topic of sex with their child, many parents just don't do it. And then this leaves your child at the hands of the culture or his friends to teach him about sex. I have created a digital toolkit just for you called How to Have the Talk with Your Child. It walks you through the process of having that initial conversation with your child about sex. The toolkit's packed with a variety of resources and all the information you need to get ready to have that initial conversation, including ages and stages chart to help you determine when to have the talk with your child. There's an ebook on talking to your child about sex, a script to help guide you through the discussion. And for those of you who are really, really chicken, you're the big chicken, it even includes a video of me giving the talk directly to your child. How easy is that? Talking to your child about sex doesn't need to be intimidating or scary. It can be really a great experience and it'll help you establish a strong relationship with your child. This month alone, I'm excited to offer you How to Have the Talk with Your Child Toolkit for 20 to 0% off. Just go to my website, megmeekermd.com, click on Parenting Resources and user code Talk podcast when you check out. Parents, this topic about sex is far too important to hand over to somebody else to talk to your kids about. You need to do it. Go to my website, check out how to have the talk with your child toolkit, 20% off. You need to stay in the driver's seat when it comes to talking to your kids about sex, and I'm here to help. Ladies, I want to introduce you to Madison Reed, a new company that's completely changing the hair color industry, giving you a better option, whether you color at home, at the salon, or both. This is the first ever at-home hair color that gives long-lasting gray coverage without many of the harsh ingredients found in other hair colors like ammonia or PPD. The color is rich, multi-tonal, and natural-looking, and you'll notice the difference right away. No harsh chemical smell, soft, shiny hair, and unbelievable shine. Madison Reed also has a love guarantee. If you're not completely satisfied with your hair, their staff of licensed colorists will send you a new color kit on them. And if you're still not satisfied, they'll give you your money back. No risk, all reward. Go to madison-reed.com and find your perfect shade. Visit today to get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit when you use the code MEG. That's madison-reed.com. Offer code MEG. As parents, we often worry about how to pass on our faith and values to our children. How can we help them understand what faith is? Well, I've discovered a terrific new book series called The Adventures of the Sea Kids, and these books can really help you teach your kids faith and values. 
The Adventures of the Sea Kids is an award-winning children's book series with vivid Disney-esque illustrations that show young readers what a relationship with Jesus looks like in a tangible, relatable way. Each of the stories in the six-book series gives children fun and entertaining examples of how to pursue a genuine faith in their day-to-day lives. I'm especially excited to share with you the newest book in the Adventures of the Sea Kids series, releasing just in time for Easter, called God's Easter Miracles. It's available for pre-order now at glmpublishing.net. Listeners of Parenting Great Kids can get 25% off when you check out using code MeekerMD. That's glmpublishing.net. And remember to use code MeekerMD for 25% off. Talk about the father who is the caretaker at home and and who can't, because I love engaged dads. I just love to see fathers who are really invested in their kids. And, and, you know, with a lot of working moms, I mean, many, many times mom is a breadwinner and dad's home with the kids. So first of all, my question is, how do dads approach sleep in their babies differently than mothers? And oh, second, do. how would they have this sort of, you know, nursing nap time? Yes, I'm glad you used the term differently for fathers because it's not better or worse. It's yeah. different. Yeah. And moms also say, well, you know, my husband, I said, that's fine. He's wired that way and you're wired this way. And you remember the, and the breadwinner situation, we actually had that in our first year of marriage when uh, Dr. Jim was born. I was a uh, poorly paid intern, you know, mm-hmm. as, as it was in those days. Martha made five times what I did as the nurse sure. in the hospital. So we would juggle. When she was on shift, she'd bring baby Jim down. I'd, I'd rock him and sleep. And then uh, she'd come down when she during coffee breaks and all and, and breastfeed. So, you know, juggling acts have been going on for a millennium now. This mm-hmm. is not new, this whole term multitasking and working and all that. Moms have done that for centuries and they've done it well. Now, dads. See, dads, I, I get this question as, you know, how do I get my husband to get my baby to sleep. So I have a uh, course in my office. We call it father nursing. Mm. So, you know, dad comes in and they're sitting there and I'm like, okay, Joe, I'm going to show you how to nurse your baby. And I know what? <laughs> they're thinking. Okay, they're, they're thinking in their head, hey, uh, yeah, I, Joe, I know what you're thinking. You, you are, you're a milk dud, okay? You, you, you can to give, give your baby the breastfeed. However, nursing does not mean breastfeeding. Nursing means comforting, so fathers can nurse. So then I say, okay, Joe, what do you have to calm your baby that your wife doesn't have? You know, they're thinking, Mm -hmm. okay, where's he going with this? Ah, you have a deep voice and a hairy chest. Mm -hmm. All right. So I call it the warm fuzzy and the neck nestle. And this worked beautifully in our family. Martha would mother nurse the baby half asleep, and then we called it the handoff. You know, it's football season, the handoff. So when, when say, Stephen was half asleep, she would hand him to me, and I would father nurse the finishing touch. Mm -hmm. I would put him against my fuzzy chest and nestle his head into the crook of my arm and drape my chin over his skull. And then I'd sing the deeper voice oh, yeah, very of the soothing. male lulls baby to sleep, sometimes better than the female voice. Yeah. Also, the male cheekbones and Adam's apple vibrates more than the females, and babies can hear with the vibration of their skull bones, too. Right. So the vibration, the warm fuzzy, and the tone of the voice that males have lulls baby right to sleep Mm -hmm. and then say on weekends we we had this custom on weekends it was time for mommy to sleep in and daddy to take baby baby wakes up in the morning gets mommy nursed and then daddy takes baby and goes off somewhere that mom can't hear Mm. and mommy goes back to sleep and daddy and baby have this baby daddy time together oh I love it and I hope that all the dads out there are listening I mean it's so important I think often fathers feel like when the babies are infants that they don't really need them they just need mom and they need breast milk and they need um, you know just to to bond very closely with the mom and I think they very much know the difference between their mom and their dad let's talk about colic just for a few minutes and I know I love it it's sort of that nasty 
65 letter word that pediatricians yeah. hate to hear because we don't know what it is and we don't know what to say. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, for the three month old baby out there and, you know, five o'clock, six o'clock at night comes and this baby starts to scream and he screams for three yeah. hours. What do you say to your patients? Well, we, we call that, uh, Meg, happy hour. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you, happy, you happy open, open you know, a bottle of very, wine or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not very happy. Yeah. Now, uh, so if, if a parent, say a parent comes in, you know, five o'clock. So I say, okay, prepare for happy hour. You say baby wake uh, does this at five o'clock. First of all, you do a three o'clock nap. Mm-hmm. Baby wakes up from the nap, and then you go in front of a window with a nice ray of light coming through, so it's warm. Followed by a walk. You put baby in a carrier, mm-hmm. and you take a walk together out in nature, weather permitting. Mm-hmm. So that uh, by the time five o'clock comes along, baby's had a nap and a walk outside. Mm. So what you've done, you've rewired the brain. I don't have to fuss, mom. Life is good. Mm-hmm. So you prepare for happy hour. And you know, that almost always works. Mm. And it does become Happy hour. Happy hour. I love that. What do you say to, I mean, everybody has their own theories about colic, and I totally agree with you. I think that there could be, you know, because a lot of parents and maybe pediatricians will pin it on gas, and, and right. but, I, but I really do think there's some reflux going on, some um, something like that. But I wonder, too, if the sleep isn't regulated and baby's overtired and they can't self-soothe. So they just get really frustrated and overtired and they cry and cry and cry because um, they're so exhausted. So do you think exhaustion plays into colic? Yes, I do. I think that's the third reason. Colic, and we studied this very carefully. In fact, in 1992, when we had the first edition of the baby book, uh, I said, you know, I'm not going to play the old game of colic. Well, we don't know. I say, when a baby hurts, there's a medical reason. When mm-hmm. an adult hurts, there's a medical reason. So we, we had uh, one page on reflux. The second edition, we had 12 pages because we learned so much. So number one cause of colic, reflux. Mm-hmm. Ask your doctor, could it be reflux? Second common cause of colic is an allergy, allergic food in mom's diet, usually wheat or dairy. And the third cause of colic is just what you mentioned. The baby is just dysregulated. They're upset, we would call it, as an adult. Mm -hmm. And those are the babies who need a consistent routine. They need lots of holding. They need lots of motion. Especially when happy hour comes, they need a pre-programming that they already know. Their brain is, oh man, I hate that that five o'clock comes. I'm going to be upset. However, if from three to five, they get a nap, preferably nestled next to a person. They get a walk in the park. Mm-hmm. Again, more nestling. Life is good. So you, so that's the third cause of so-called upset or colic is they are dysregulated and they need a routine to regulate them. Yeah. You know, call it routine. I, I often tell parents that we have a rhythm to our days. And babies yeah. need a rhythm to their days. We, we like mm-hmm. predictability. We like to know what's going to happen yeah. in the afternoon. You know, what mm-hmm. association or connection is there between eating and sleeping? Huge, huge correlation. We have a, a chapter on that in our baby sleep book, too. Now, one of the reasons that breastfed babies tend to drift off to sleep so much, so easily, mm-hmm. it's called the microbiome. That yeah. term microbiome is the biggest term in medicine right now. So yeah. we'll spend about one minute on that. Microbiome just means the trillions of gut bugs, the mm-hmm. normal bacteria that live in your intestines. And in return for free food and a warm place to live, they do good things for you. Mm-hmm. Now, breast milk is the favorite food of gut bugs. Now, where is serotonin made the most? In your gut. So when a baby is happy by the way they are fed, they make more relaxing, happy hormones, serotonin. So that's one reason that food, like breast milk, is so sleep-inducing. Now, many parents or mothers of, of young babies, I find... 
if a baby is fussy and, um, you know, maybe every hour they, they'll nurse the baby and they'll say, you know, all I do all day long is nurse this baby and he's never sleeps and he's never content. What should I do? What would your recommendation be on timing of feeding and how long you should feed and how frequently? Oh, well, the, when a mother says that, and, and you're right, I get that question too. I say, all right, tell me, are you okay, mom? If the answer is yes, I don't mind. I love holding my baby, but I'm just wondering, you know, my friend says I'm spoiling her. So as soon as mom says, I'm okay with this, I know it's not going to last, I say, wonderful. Because the more touch time, the more skin-to-skin contact, the more face time you and your baby have together during those early years, the smarter baby will be, the healthier baby will be. And you will raise what I call a caring child. That Mm. child will never be a bully. Mm. Mm. And they say, oh, really? Yeah, it makes that much difference. Absolutely. Dr. Sears, this has been so much fun. And I'm so excited that our listeners get to hear you because I don't know who described and helped uh, describe sleep patterns and helped parents with helping their kids sleep before you did. I really, do. I don't know if anybody did. Um, and so that's why I call you the sleep guru. But I really, really appreciate the time that you've given us. And thank you so much for all that you do. Well, thank you. It's been an honor to be on your program. All right, let's get social. I want to hear from you and interact with you. You can connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Meg Meeker MD. Or if you have a question, please send it in. Ask Meg at MegMeekerMD.com. Today, I have a question from Lisa who writes, Dear Dr. Meg, my daughter is almost 15 and I'm struggling to understand how to balance discipline and build a relationship. If my daughter gets in trouble and has consequences for her actions, how do I also build a relationship and expect her to tell me things and open up to me? I don't know how to do both. I've always been more about discipline Come to find out, though, my daughter has talked a lot about hating me. Now I'm trying to repair a relationship with her, but I feel like I'm trying to be her friend. I feel so lost. Lisa, what a wonderful, wonderful question. You're living the tension that every good parent of a teenager lives with. And the tension is this. I am mom. I need to lead. I am wiser. I am smarter. I think with more complexity than this 15-year-old. I know what's best for this 15-year-old, but I also want to enjoy this 15-year-old. And part of me really wants her to like me too. And I want her to want to be with me like she wants to be with her friends. So I, I really don't know how to have a foot in each camp. Well, here's the deal. You can accomplish both, but maybe not at the same time. Your job from 15 until she's 25, when now you're allowed to be your child's friend, because then they have full cognitive development, they have full maturity, emotionally they should be pretty mature, and now they're thinking like a complete adult. Until that time, you're really not dealing with an adult. So you cannot have an adult relationship with your teenage daughter. You don't want to be 18 in order to communicate with a teen. And she can't be an adult, so you can't have an adult adult relationship. You you have to have an adult teen relationship, and it's not what you want. But hold on, you will get there. First of all, a teenager has a need to respect a parent because it makes them feel safe. They have a need to know somebody else is in charge because inside their mind and their heart, they feel chaos. They don't know what they want for dinner. They don't know what they want to study. They don't know what they, who they want their friends to be. They need order and they need security. You must provide that for her. And you can't provide that for her if you are relating to her as a friend. Her friends can't provide that for her. You want to, but you can't. So you need to provide her with authority and order and leadership. Does that mean you need to be a jerk? Does it mean you need to be mean? No. It means you need to be an authority, a firm authority, not a mean authority, but a reasonable one. And you need to say, here's the deal, daughter. There are rules in this house that I and dad set. And so 
we're in charge of those rules. Now, you are 15. You don't have as many rules as you did when you were eight. But these are the rules and these are the consequences of when you break those rules. Your phone gets taken away. Your um, your car gets taken away. Whatever it is, whatever really bothers your kid. But other than that, you have a lot of freedom to do a lot of great things. So we're not going to belabor the rules. We're not going to belabor the consequences. That's just the way it is. And then you're prepared when she breaks those rules. And I wrote, incidentally, in my 12 Principles of Raising Great Kids, I have a whole principle on discipline. I have tapes. I have a book. I have I have everything you need to know about disciplining your kid, whether it's 2 or 15 or 18 in my 12 Principles. So you need to go and take a look at that. But it's very important that you understand you are disciplining her Because she needs to have a well-disciplined life that she is in charge of after 25. She'll never learn how to discipline herself if you don't teach her discipline. So remember that. You're not being mean. Then what you do after you establish these rules is you say, okay, that's the rules. We don't need to talk about them anymore. You have a curfew. You speak to me this way. Whatever your rules are. And then you don't belabor them. And your consequences are clear. When she breaks a rule... Boom, the consequences happen. You don't argue. She can cry. She can slam the door. She can call you names. She can say she hates you, which, by the way, if she were to and said, I hate my mom, I hate you, mom, I hate you, mom, would you pay attention to her? Of course you wouldn't. So why do you pay attention when she's 15? She's not thinking like an adult. She's saying how she feels. She's angry. She doesn't hate you. She thinks she hates you. So don't have such thin skin. Don't take your kids personally, people. Remember, they feel chaos inside. So you've got to let that roll off you. It's okay. You know, most healthy teenagers at some point in their life feel like they hate their parent, but they get through it. Okay. If she's starting to run away, that's a different story. Or if she's starting to uh, talk about committing suicide, that's a different story. But she's just saying she hates you. This is normal teen antics. So if she breaks a rule and then you implement the consequences, you don't engage in a fight with her. She can fight and then you just stand there with a smile on your face if you want and oh well, this is it. Sorry, the phone's taken away for a week. Or you can't go to soccer practice for a week. Sorry, you knew this. And she'll blame you and she'll try to talk you out of the consequence and she'll tell you you're mean and she'll tell you that all of her friends' parents never would do this to their children. You let it roll right off because that's what teens do. Now, this is very important. You let her have her fit. You let her slam the doors. You let her not talk to you for a week while you're implementing the consequence and you just go about your business and you don't engage in a fight. Then when you're done, you go out and you do something fun and you say, hey, do you want to go for a movie or do you want to go out to dinner with me? No, I don't want to do that. Why would I want to do that with you? I hate you. All right, maybe tomorrow you'll want to. And eventually you are talking to her about leaving the bad event behind and doing something fun. So what you're trying to teach her how to do is look. Breaking rules, being disciplined, having consequences is part of life. Get over it. You know, if you do something in your workplace in 15 years, you're going to tick your boss off and you're going to have a consequence. Deal with a consequence and don't do that again. Let's move on. One of the big mistakes a lot of parents make is they don't move on. They get caught up in the cycle of, oh, this is terrible and this is terrible and my child hates me and we have this bad relationship because all I do is discipline her. Okay, you know, let your child feel awful about the consequences, but don't you move on and Balance the life with your child between bad events like discipline and consequences and good events where you're not thinking about it, where you're trying to have some fun together and you are clearly communicating to your child, I'm not going to talk about your bad behavior anymore. Let's go do something fun because I love you. I went through this. You have to go through this. Guess what? I live by rules too. We all have to learn to live by rules. The mistake a lot of parents make is they forget the second part and that's having the fun and and not talking about all the bad stuff and constantly reaching out to do something engaging with your kids. You can have fun as an adult and a child. You can have fun as a 40-year-old with your 15-year-old. You know, you can take her shopping and you can say, okay, these are the stores that I approve of. These other stores, no thanks. But you can go into this store and we can, you know, buy whatever you want in that store, whatever dresses, whatever. So you can establish rules, but you can still have fun within those rules. So that's really important to do with your daughter. Great question, Lisa. I really appreciate it so much. 
Parents, I love answering your questions, so keep sending them in to me. You can email your parenting questions to askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Again, that's askmeg at megmeekermd.com. I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Bill Sears. I encourage everyone, go out and pick up one of his books. They're wonderful. If you're interested in attachment parenting, read his attachment parenting book. If you're interested in sleep issues, read his sleep book. They're wonderful, wonderful resources for you. Um, and I also like, if you're confused about vaccines, uh, read his son, Dr. Bob Sears' book called The Vaccine Book. So let me recap my points to ponder here. One, if you're having sleep issues with your child, remember... Remember, help your baby establish a good sleep environment that's consistent from nap time to night time. Two, put your baby to bed awake, maybe just barely awake, but put him in the crib awake. I guarantee you if you do it early on, you'll be so glad you did. You don't want to have to put a screaming 18-month-old to bed. And three, help your baby establish a good eating and sleep rhythm. And the best way to do that is to control when they eat and to make sure that they're very satisfied and full after a good meal. So until next time, parents, remember, great kids are raised, not born. Hey, this is Bobby, producer of Meg Meeker's Parenting Great Kids podcast. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Episode 23, Sleep Issues in Kids. And thanks to you, Dr. Meg's Parenting Revolution has grown to over a half a million downloads. You can like Dr. Meeker on Facebook, follow her on Twitter and Instagram, at Meg Meeker MD. And just as a reminder, go to MegMeekerMD.com and sign up for her newsletter for giveaway opportunities and updates. And don't forget to share the podcast, write us a review, and click subscribe so you won't miss an episode.